Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Whitetail Rendezvous is pleased to announce a partnership with GoHunt.com. Who's GoHunt.com? Well, if you're a DIY hunter, You need the information at GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Why? Because it provides 4,200 profiles, every unit, every species, and every season. Furthermore, they give in-depth analysis, interactive maps, unit access, and seasonal trends. Draws are very important, and they give you the most accurate information in the business. All this is available when you go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Make sure you use promo code WR when you join Insider. You'll get a $50 gift card for GoHunt.com gear shop. Remember, when you become a member of GoHunt.com forward slash Insider, you're going to get a $50 gift card to GoHunt gear shop. What's in the gear shop? The best gear that you can buy for hunting the West. This gear has been field tested by some of the best, and they know what it can do, what it can't do. You're going to get reviews, and you're going to have a selection that is bar none right at the top of the list. Having said that, once you get your gift card, all you have to do is go to GoHunt.com and go to the first page and click on Shop and go have some fun. All in all, if you're hunting out west in 2018, GoHunt.com Insider is where you need to be to get all the research information. When you use promo code WR, Whitetail Rendezvous receives a small commission from GoHunt.com. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rondo. This is your host and executive producer, Bruce Hutchin. We're heading out to Nebraska to a good friend, Kevin Paulson. Kevin is the CEO of HoneyLife.com. Kevin, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Bruce. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Hey, you just came back from ATA, and I don't know, are you going out to SHOT Show or Sheep Show? Where's your next show? Yeah, I keep... Yeah, I came back from ATA. Uh, I've got a uh, week here at home. I got back Sunday night. Uh, I've got, um, I'm leaving Saturday morning to head out to Las Vegas for SHOT Show. Uh, I'll be out there for an entire week, and uh, I come home for two days. Uh, I turn around and go right back to Vegas for uh, the uh, SCI show, so uh, Safari Club International's Hunters Convention. So I'm, it's, a, it's a busy, busy time of year for me. Yeah, it sounds like it. Just to help um, the listeners across North America, what does HuntingLife.com really do for the hunter? Yeah, so HuntingLife.com is a national news site focused on hunting and conservation all across North America and the world. So we try to work with the entire industry to help spread the message of the new products that are coming out, the new gear that's coming out the trends that are going on in the industry, uh, what the, is going on in the conservation world, what's going on with like the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation or National Wild Turkey Foundation or Ducks Unlimited. Uh, we pay attention to the political climate of what's going on uh, in Congress and in our states. Uh, and we try to report about all of those things uh, so that people have a resource that they can go to to learn what's going on in the hunting industry and what's going on in the hunting world. Now, how's that different than reading a magazine or, you know, Hunter's News or Outdoor News or, you know, any of these magazines or newspapers that come out and aggregate information and stories and and share them with their readership? Sure. What's, uh, you know, A, what's different is that uh, HuntingLife.com produces on average 15 articles every single day. And And those go onto our website live every single day. So we're providing the most new and up-to-date resource we could possibly provide on a daily basis. And we do that year-round, and we've been around for now 11 years. Um, What's different from that versus uh, a magazine that's out there is, you know, a lot of magazines in today's world are dying. Um, You know, we get 80% of our reading our information, our sources right here from a cell phone. And so Hunting Life produces all of its content where you can get all of your video, your news, and everything right here in your cell phone or on your tablet or on your computer at home. Um, 
you know, we just learned that uh, Field and Stream is actually dropping the number of issues uh, that they have, and Outdoor Life is doing the same thing uh, over this next year. Um, you know, the magazine and the print industry is dying, and uh, people are expecting all of their news and information to be electronic. And Hunting Life, our goal is to be the largest hunting website that anybody goes to on a yearly basis. How do you produce 15 articles a day? Uh, how does that happen? Well, we aggregate some uh, content from some of our partners across the entire industry. Uh, we were just at ATA, and we were talking to um, companies and partners at, all the way through the entire industry. And uh, they help us produce some content. We're working with pro staff from many different uh, hunting companies throughout the United States. And uh, we're working and empowering those pro staff to create content for us. Uh, we have a stable of our own writers. Uh, we have um, a few, you know, really tremendous writers coming on uh, staff this year, uh, which I, I'm not ready to announce. But uh, by the end of SCI, we'll be ready to announce. Uh, we'll have at least two national writers that uh, I think everybody uh, who watches a White Tail Rendezvous will know exactly who they are. Um, we're excited to bring them on board. We're going to be continuing to acquire new writers throughout uh, 2018, and we're making a tremendous investment in our website. So um, I think that we're doing everything we can for our community uh, from a technological perspective uh, and from an information gathering perspective. Um, I'm looking for more writers every single day. And so, you know, individuals who are looking to – uh, broaden their horizons and, and, you know, step into the hunting world, uh, they can always send me an email at Kevin at huntinglife.com. And, and uh, I'll, I ask every single person who uh, comes to me to do, I ask them to do the same thing. I ask them to write me a product review of a, pro, of a piece of gear that they really, really love. And I ask them to write me a story about what inspires them in the hunting world. And um, those two articles are basically like, that's your ticket to, if I like what I read and I think you can actually write, then, uh, you know, I invite people to come on board and, you know, become a writer for HoneyLife.com. Um, every single person, you know, their first year, uh, they have to write 12 articles in their first year. And if they write those 12 articles, uh, I edit them uh, with my team. And, uh, you know, we produce feedback back to them. And at the end of those 12 articles, uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll sponsor them to become uh, a member in a writing organization that's closest to them, whether that's, you know, POMA or GLOW or SIOPA or the Outdoor Writers Association. We'll, we'll pay for that. And so, you know, we're, we, we want to, you know, develop new writers because I think that's really important. Now, so I submit everything and you go, man, this stuff is off the charts. Do I get paid? Um, you can get paid after the first year. Yeah, after the first 12 articles, you can get paid. Um, the first 12 articles for new writers, uh, I do not pay for, um, but I do pay for the sponsorship into a writing organization. So it's kind of like a trial period. And folks, if you don't know POMA, Professional Outdoor Media Association, I belong to that because uh, I have done some writing in the past, and obviously I have a podcast. But um, there's good organizations out there and if you're going to be serious about being a writer being a contributor uh bringing content to some sort of medium then you need to belong to one of those organizations bar none just don't even yeah. think about it yeah i ask people i mean i invest back in those people and you know i'm investing in coaching and time out of my schedule uh, i'm really focused on trying to you know i want young new writers to come on board um the more, the better, to be honest with you, because it's a win for me. Uh, and I know that it's a win for the people that work with me. Um, I've had several writers who are now members of other organizations um, that um, they got their start with me. And uh, I'm very proud of that fact. Um, you know, those young men who were college, you know, college students when they started with me and uh, they now work for other organizations uh, in the hunting industry. And I'm very, very proud of them. I'm proud of what they've accomplished, and um, I know that um, the work with me helped them get to that place. And so I'm super excited about that fact, and and I believe that um, I believe that I create a value for um, you know those individuals as a writer, and I believe that those individuals create a value for me in writing great content. 
So how are you guys different than wide open spaces? Uh, what is very different from wide open spaces and hunting life is that um, we focus on different things. Um, they focus on um, they focus on writing a different kind of content that we do, and we're much more focused on conservation angle and you know kind of being more of a news source. Um, I expect that you know as time goes on, things will change a little bit, and um, there's you know. Lots of differences all the way across the board, but there, you know, there are great resources as well. So, folks, if you have any bent to um, get into the outdoor business and you feel you can write, and I think everybody can write, it's just you got to have the right mentors and tutors because everybody has ideas and everybody has their own voice. So, get a hold of Kevin at HuntingLife.com and say, "Hey, here's something I did, and uh, you know, what do you think?" and and go from there because. Don't sit and say, man, I would like to, I'd like to. Just go ahead and do it. That's the best advice I can. Any advice for people that are, want to, but they just don't have the guts? Yeah, you you know, you got to start somewhere. I mean, to be honest with you, you know, I built this entire business from nothing. And I didn't know what I was doing. Um, to be honest, you know, when I built Hunting Life, I had the, you know, field of dreams mentality. Uh, I tell everybody that, uh, you know, if you build it, they will come. And, uh, you know, I've learned. Uh, that, you know, running an internet business is a, a you know, lot more complicated than that, you know, pie in the sky vision of I'm going to go out and build great content and people are going to come to my website. Uh, it doesn't quite work that way. You've got to, uh, you know, build great content, but you've also got to promote that content all day long in every facet you possibly can. Uh, you know, my advice to anybody is you got to start somewhere and you got to take one step and then another step. And then another step. And you got to keep going down that process, Um, you know, making decisions as quickly as you possibly can on any given day. Um, Just go forth and do it. Yeah, sounds like a Nike commercial. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I wake up every morning and I've got 100 things to do. And I start doing one and I do that one really, really well. And then I do the next one and I just keep going. You know, some days I get, you know, 15 items on my to do list done. Some days I get two. Um, You just got to keep you know, moving forward every single day. Thanks for sharing that. Let's uh, change it up a little bit. Let's talk about your hunting tradition. I know you love to hunt. And uh, so where did the desire to hunt come from? Uh, My desire to uh, hunt really came from my father. And so, um, you know, when I was five years old, I was in this little town called Levining, California. Uh, It was on the uh, eastern side of California, the Sierras. Uh, kind of a gateway to Yosemite, and and uh, I went on a duck hunt with my dad uh, near this little lake called Mono Lake, and and then I went uh, out uh, on a mule deer hunt with him, and you know I got to walk in his footprints uh, at you know five years old. I was like the, my goal was to you know step in his footprints every time you know he stepped forward, and uh, you know we saw antelope and we saw mule deer, and I was obsessed, and I've been obsessed ever since. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of a part of my, you know, my hunting tradition. Now, all three of my kids, uh, uh, three of my five kids have have gotten to experience hunting. Um, and, you know, they have each taken a deer and, uh, and one of my daughters has taken a turkey and, um, uh, I've got two more kids to, to slowly introduce to hunting. Now, I know you got married just uh, a couple of years ago and, and did your wife hunt previously to get married or is this something new? No, uh, Marjorie um, got introduced to hunting um, through me, um, but Marjorie and I have very uh, a very strong uh, drive for really high quality food. And so when you know Marjorie and I started dating, we had this passion for uh, cooking and uh, culinary arts, and you know a passion for you know really great ingredients. Uh, to put on our plate and to cook. And so, you know, she came to hunting with the realization that in order to put ducks and geese and pheasant and venison on her plate, she had to go out and learn how to hunt it. And so, you know, that's how she got involved in it. Now, she's always been involved in the outdoors. She loves she loved to run when we first met. Uh, she loved to backpack and, and be in the outdoors, camping and all of those things. So hunting was a, you know, natural progression for her and she loves it. Um, you know, this is actually, uh, 
the first year in the last five uh, that she hasn't killed a, 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 a whitetail. So how is it for a husband and wife to go hunting? I've heard horror stories because guys love to be in charge and we get really stupid. At least I have in the past when I tried to take my wife out hunting. So how has it worked so well for you? I think for me and my perspective, um, I've taken a lot of hunters out hunting and I've started mentoring in my early 20s. Um, so I've been mentoring and guiding people most of my life. And so for me, I understand that when I'm guiding somebody, I've got to slow myself down and go at the pace of the individual who I'm guiding. And so for Marjorie and for, and this is true for, you know, taking any wife out hunting or any kid out hunting, you have to make it enjoyable for them. And you have to understand uh, what it is that they're looking for um, in an experience. And so, you know, for Marjorie, I know that, you know, getting out into a place that's, you know, beautiful country and, you know, getting to watch the sun come up and getting to experience that and getting to pay attention to, you know, everything from, you know, the squirrel climbing up on a tree to, you know, the birds flying overhead or, you know, the gobble of a turkey, uh, you know, off in the distance. Those are all things that, you know, we pay attention to and are very attuned to. Um, and I focus on that when we're when I'm with her. And so, you know, that makes it much more enjoyable for her. I'm pointing these things out. And um, the other thing is, uh, if you take your, your wife or your kids out, uh, you know, part of your goal is to make sure that they're comfortable. And so, you know, I made sure that Marjorie had uh, the best gear. Um, you know, I have her outfitted in uh, the Pro is women's line of clothing. So she has a set of Pro is pants and she has, um, you know, she has a, a full layering system on and she has a Pro is jacket and she's warm and comfortable. And that makes her experience in the outdoors uh, much more enjoyable for her. Um, a lot of the hunting that Marjorie and I are doing in the area that we're hunting we're not just sitting in a, a blind. Uh, we're up and we're moving and uh, we're doing a lot of spot and stock. And so I don't know for Marjorie and I, that works for us because she really loves to backpack and hike. And so we spend a lot of time on foot hiking, you know, in and around canyons. And it's just, it's a tremendous amount of fun. Sounds like you get a good part of there. Say when you're out uh, chasing mule deer, um, what kind of glass do you use? Um, I use a wide variety of glass because I'm constantly testing uh, new optics on any given hunt. Um, so, you know, guys ask me like, well, what's your favorite pair of binoculars? And, I, and to be honest with you, the answer changes on any given month. Um, you know, right now, I think I actually have. Uh, yeah, actually, I do have. Um, right this moment, I'm actually using Steiner's. Um, and the reason I'm using these is because this is what I've been testing the last month. Uh, these are the Steiner HX 10 by 56 binoculars. Um, they kind of have the eye cups on them. They are a very heavy set of glass. So this is not probably what I would necessarily recommend for, you know, quick and dirty spot and stock archery hunts. Uh, but if you're sitting on the edge of a canyon wall and you're glassing long distances for extended periods of time, these, this glass is just absolutely fantastic. Um, and I think they're at a price point around $1,000. Um, so not necessarily the most expensive on the market, but not the cheapest. Um, I like binoculars from, you know, the Vanguard line. Um, the Vortex line is excellent in kind of the lower range of binoculars. Um, you know, mid-range binoculars, the Steiners or the Burris binoculars are fantastic all the way up to, you know, the Leica and the Zeiss and the Swarovskis. Um, I will say that I think the binoculars are very, very much a personal preference. And you really need to look at a lot of different binoculars. I have um, stood with three different people and grabbed the most expensive pair of binoculars up off of the counter. And all three of us as individuals saw something different through those binoculars. You know, some binoculars work for some people and some binoculars do not work for some people. And so as an, in, 
as an individual, if your buddies are all saying, you know, you should buy Vortex, if they don't fit to your eyes, if you don't feel great with that pair of binoculars in your hands and your eyes aren't really picking out shapes with crystal clarity, don't buy them. You know, go try a different pair. Um, some people, you know, just need different, you know, different things for different packages, different people. So you're out um, Western Nebraska and you do have your favorite glass. How do you use them? How do I use them as, as yeah. far as how I use them to for hunting? So I, I, yeah, so for hunting. So I basically, I spend, um, when I pull into the ranch, basically, um, I pick two, I have three basic high spots on the ranch that I hunt. Uh, that I pull up um, into, and then basically I, I walk up onto these high spots, and I pick apart uh, an entire area. And so my goal with a set of optics and a spotting scope uh, is to grid search uh, where the deer are. Uh, if it's first thing in the morning, I'm watching the deer walk off the top of the plateaus, and they're dropping into canyons. And I'm basically watching them to figure out where specifically, you know, I know generally where their bedding areas are. And so I'm kind of like watching to figure out which bedding area they're going to go to. And then I'm watching which way the wind is blowing uh, so that I can figure out how to come back and go, you know, come in over top of them basically. Um, now, if I just pull in to an area mid afternoon and I don't know that area, I don't know, you know, what's on the side of that mountain basically, uh, I'm basically grid searching um an entire area so you know i'm going to search up in the high section up here i'm going to move down a little bit i'm going to grid search with the binoculars i'm going to come down a little bit further i'm going to grid search i'm going to come down i'm going to grid search come down grid search and then i just continue to move my way across the mountain and i basically just do that you know in a very you know i do it in a very fast way and then i go back and i any section that I feel like has real potential, I'll go back and break that down even further. Now, you know, for mule the, deer, when mule deer are in CRP or whitetails for that matter, <laughs> sometimes the only thing you see is a flick of a ear, or, you know, the horns glint off the sun because uh, they're resting. They're they're really not doing anything. Every once in a while, one may get up, but for the most part, you're looking for pieces. How do you find them? Yeah, I'm looking for shapes or movement um, as much as humanly possible. And I'm just looking for cer certain things that are out of the ordinary. Um, it, over time, you tend to um, you tend to know basically, you know, where um, where you think an animal may or may not be. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of intuition. Um, so for me, you know, I'm, I'm, it's just a little bit, like I said, it's a little bit of intuition. I'm always looking for that deer you know, that little ear flick, uh, because sometimes you'll see that more often than not. Uh, you know, it's one of the reasons I love hunting mule deer. To date, um, are you hunting for meat or are you hunting for bone? Uh, I hunt for both at all times. Um, so the ranch that I hunt currently um, is in an area that uh, is available for me to purchase uh, mule deer doe tags or whitetail doe tags. And um, so I purchased doe tags uh, because the rancher can only afford to feed so many deer on a given year. And he currently has an overpopulation of does on his property. Uh, I can only, you know, I can only uh, fit so many in my freezer. Um, so, you know, I fill my freezer basically with doe meat. And then uh, I focus on um, really, really big deer the rest of the year. Um, I do. I passed up this year. This year I did not shoot a buck. Uh, I shot milder, I shot milder does, and I shot a white-tailed doe. And uh, I did not shoot a buck this year at all. Um, and I'm okay with that because um, I'm bigger empty. I passed up 150 bucks, whether they, they were white-tail or milder bucks. I had both a milder buck tag and a white-tail buck tag uh, in Nebraska, and um, I did not shoot either. But I did not shoot a buck at all. Just because they were too small. Yeah, I just did not see one that was representative of, you know, really what I wanted to shoot. And I did miss one. So um, I did miss, you know, I missed a good deer uh, in rifle season uh, for a uh, mule deer. Now, how about your wife? Does she hunt for, for food and she'll shoot those also? Yeah, she actually, uh, 
at, as of this point, uh, she has only purchased uh, dope permits. Um, she's a teacher, and uh, during the rifle season, and it is very hard for her to get off. And so um, she, uh, we hunt together uh, kind of during the Christmas break, and that's kind of the antlerless season. And so she has not had the opportunity to go to shoot a buck yet. But she's perfectly happy to shoot the, the, the milder doe or white tailed doe. Let's stop right there. How did you teach her to how to shoot either a bow or and or a rifle? Um, well, first, I, I, um, I didn't. Um, I actually um, put her uh, with, a, with another uh, shooting camp, and uh, I let somebody else teach her that part. So um, she was pretty natural as a shot. Um, and, um, and she had, she did, you know, start shooting with me, but her initial interaction with shooting was actually with a, with a different instructor. Would you recommend that to other husbands or boyfriends that let somebody else, you know, uh, get their partner, um, uh, you know, schooled up, if you will? I, in certain cases, yes. <laughs> um, you know, if you have somebody local who, uh, you know, is an expert or is a great instructor. Uh, sometimes it really is, um, you know, a smart path to allow somebody else to to do that teaching. Um, I find that women uh, listen incredibly well. And in fact, I think as a guide, I always liked guiding women, um, you know, much more than I liked guiding men, specifically because they really listened and they really wanted to be successful. Um, you know, Marjorie really wants to be successful, and she wants to make a shot that is an ethical, clean shot as quickly as possible. And so if I say, okay, we're going to come around this corner, uh, I'm going to put you on the sticks, and immediately, you know, pull up and put the crosshair on the, um, you know, on the shoulder and pull the trigger, she listens to that. And so when we come around the corner, she's prepared. Now, um, with my with my friends, uh, when we go hunting and I say, you know, here's what I want you to do, they don't always listen. Their their mindset is, well, I'm going to do what I want to do. And it's a lot different than, uh, you know, my relationship with uh, my wife or or for that matter, any other woman that I've ever guided. Um, you know, I have several friends that I've hunted with over the years and, you know, like it's, it's really noticeable to me, like, when I go out with my guy friends and so we go hunting and I say, dude, I want you in my hip pocket, like, we're, we're going to, you know, I need you to follow me. You know, all of a sudden, they're 20 yards to my right. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, get behind me and let's, you know, go together, uh, you know, over this, you know, over this uh, hillside. And, you know, invariably throughout the day, they're constantly, like, trying to go on their own path. So I, it's something I've just kind of noticed as a guide for years and years. Um, women do a much better job of listening. And I would support that uh, back in the day when I was doing some fly fishing and guiding. Uh, I'd love to take women out, you know, yeah. to get them on the stream because they knew nothing about fly fishing. They wanted to do it. It looked fun, yada, yada, yada. And all you do is say, you know, try this real simple stuff, nothing difficult at all. And they'd actually do it. And guess what? They'd outfish the men. Yeah. They'd outfish their husbands. Women, women, women are dramatically better shooters than men all the way across the board. Um, I've rarely um, had a situation where a woman couldn't outshoot a man in just about every situation I've ever been in. Uh, sometimes in shotgun, you know, you'll see a, a guy who's got a lot of experience and he'll outshoot, you know, a woman right there. But with a little bit of instruction, there's almost no question that women are just tremendously better shooters all the way across the board. We're going to segue now into the hunting industry. I know you're going to SHOT Show and, and you've been to ATA and you've been in the business, what, 15 years now? Is it 15 years for hunting life? Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's just, it's, it's getting to be right out, right out 15 years of, uh, uh, when I bought my outfitting business, uh, you know, several years of that, and then, uh, this is my 12th year of uh, owning HuntingLife.com. So let's talk about the changes and the challenges ahead for the hunting industry, the outdoor industry. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, the industry is changing uh, dramatically, and um, 
you know, the world of the world is changing dramatically. You know, we see, um, you know, the growth of Amazon.com and the growth of the online world. And, you know, guys can purchase anything they want online. And, um, you know, I think that's dramatically going to change and affect the outdoor industry. Um, I think that, um, you know, the local mom and pop sporting goods store that used to be in every little town is no longer there. And, um, you know, that's kind of sad to me. Um, you know, I grew up in a, you know, a little town that had, you know, six, 700 people in it, you know, Bell Sporting Goods in, in, you know, Lee Vining. And, you know, that store is no longer there. So it's, you know, a dramatically, you know, it's a dramatically different world. We were just, a, you know, I just walked out of ATA and, you know, the manufacturers there, they're like, you know, traffic is down this year. And I like, guys, you know, as an industry, traffic is going to be down every year because there's going to be less and less sporting goods stores that are going to be, you know, out there. And so, you know, the industry um, has got to learn how to adapt to that. Um, they've got to, you know, they're going to have to pay attention to it. And I think there are. Um, you mentioned something um, about uh, Ozonics uh, changing changing up. I don't know if they've announced that yet or if they did an ATA, but I think that's noteworthy. Uh as a major, you know, leader in ozone, you know, uh, scent control, if you want to call it that, I think that's a good, that's a good name for it because it just eliminates the scent. Yeah. And, yeah. and so what, what's that announcement again? Yeah. So Ozonics is going to a direct cons to consumer model. Uh, you know, there are several companies within the industry that have a direct to consumer model. Uh, that means basically that if you want to buy their product, you have to go directly to their company. So you're going to go like Kuyu uh, is an example where you can buy the Kuyu clothing uh, directly from Kuyu.com. And Ozonics, you're going to have to go to the Ozonics website in order to buy Ozonics, uh, where you used to be able to purchase it at Cabela's and Bass Pro and, you know, every mom and pop sporting goods store in America. Um, the problem with that is that... Um, there is uh, a markup to taking a manufactured product and, you know, putting it into a distributor and the distributor putting it into retail stores across North America. <coughs> and the consumer has to pay for that. And so a direct to, to consumer model um, can really, um, you know, bring about a, a lower price product for the consumer and a higher profit margin for the manufacturer. And so I think that over the next um, 10 years, you're going to see a lot of companies that are going to consider that process. So Ozonics was not at ATA this year um, because, you know, if you only go to ATA basically to be able to advertise and put your product into an archery store and because it's not a consumer show. And so, you know, they weren't at ATA. And, um, you know, I know that uh, Kuyu does not show up at SHOT Show or they don't show up at ATA. And uh, they're at the consumer shows because they're going direct to consumer. And at Pro is, is another company that's, you know, Pro is uh, .com. It's, it's women's clothing line. They're another co company that does direct to consumer, and they do a very good job of it. So, uh, Kirstie Pike, uh, CEO of Pro is, uh, here's a shout out for you. And she changed her marketing plan a, a few years back. I don't know exactly when she changed it, but she saw this trend coming. And, um, you know, this, that's a, beautiful American story, uh, you know, lady entrepreneur that grew from nothing, just like you, Kevin, to start, you know, with an idea and has built, you know, one of the foremost women apparel companies in the outdoors in, in the country. Absolutely. Yeah. She has a tremendous success story. And um, I've never met uh, a woman who uh, wears her clothing line that is unhappy with the quality and the cut and the feel and the warmth of the gear that they get from that, you know, from that company. So, um, you know, she has a tremendous following of people, uh, you know, it's a great family. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm super happy to see her having success with her line. And I'm super happy to uh, introduce women to her clothing line because I know that uh, those women are comfortable and they're warm and they're uh, they have enough gear with them uh, to where they can last the entire day hunting with me. So uh, it's a win all the way across the board. It's a great line. 
And, um, you know, the direct-to-consumer model keeps the prices down uh, for those women to purchase that gear. If, if Kirsty had to put her product into Cabela's or Shields or Bass Pro, uh, some of those clothing items would cost twice as much. And that's just not um, effective. Yep. So, again, shout out for Pro's uh, Honey Apparel, Kirsty Pike, and just reach out to them on any sort of social media and uh, – Try it out, ladies, because you will not be disappointed, guaranteed. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what else so is I happening that, in the hunting industry? Uh, I think we're continuing to see some, uh, you know, we've got a downturn right now in kind of like the shooting world because it's, you know, we're, we've got a Republican president. And so we've seen, uh, you know, there's not a, there's not anybody, there's no fear in the industry. So, you know, I think that the uh, overall, uh, you know, sales were down in, in 2017 from, you know, from archery to hunting to, you know, the gun world. I mean, sales, I think, were down all across the entire industry. Uh, but that being said, I, there's tremendous amounts of innovation this year. Uh, we've seen some great new products come into the market. Um, Garmin had a brand new rangefinder uh, that uh, was set up to where basically – once you zeroed it in, uh, it had a it had a red dot sight for a bow, and uh, no matter what you were aimed at, um, it uh, would adjust your sight for you. Uh, it was a laser rangefinder built into it, and uh, you know we'll be we'll you know I don't know how many uh, states will legalize that, um, but it's you know an innovative product. Uh, we saw some great new uh, arrows and knocks and things like that at ATA. Uh, there were several new bows from the new Bowtech realm to the uh, Matthews Triax and the G5 bow. Uh, there's some great new uh, – Hoyt has a new bow this year. Uh, you know, everybody has a new bow this year, and there's some great, you know, technology out there. Uh, Raven is continuing to be the biggest success story in the entire archery industry with their, you know, crossbows. Uh, they launched three new models this year, including – a full-scale, uh, what they call a sniper package uh, that was just absolutely fantastic with a, you know, a higher level scope and a, a very impressive setup. Um, uh, the uh, Probably the product of the uh, show that everybody was kind of talking about at ATA was the new Pro is Blind uh, that you could see through. And in fact, if you go to the uh, facebook.com forward slash hunting life, there is a video of me sitting in the see-through blind from ProIS. It's their new double bowl see-through blind, and you could see through the walls, uh, and it was like literally like looking right through a window. Uh, it was unbelievable, and you, we took the camera, and I shoved it through the window, and I had my partner film back into the blind, and you could not see me in the, in the blind. Um, I'm really excited to get that out for testing uh, because I really want to see – how that works at sunset and at sun sunset and sunrise uh, when it, you know, you get that orange sun right there and the, you know, does it really like, does it change how the, how you can see out that window? Um, but I think that that product is incredibly innovative and I really, really like the idea of it because um, you know, sitting in a blind, you're always sitting there going, what can I not see? And honestly, with this blind, I was, I was blown away and I think everybody really was. So, you know, that technology of that netting or whatever it is that they're creating. And I think you'll see that technology in several new blinds over the next six to eight months. Yeah. Sounds, sounds interesting. That's, that's sure. <laughs> so here we are, we got, you know, we got a Republican president. So people have the guns that they need. They're not in fear of that. We've got some changes from, um, you know, the retail, uh, model to you know the direct model what do you think the people like Realtree or lacrosse boots or sitka or you know the name some of the the giants you know in in our industry that sell you know that sell through retailers that that's how they sell their product what are they going to do well i think that they're going to continue to have success i mean i don't think people are walking away from retailers uh per se at this point I think that um, my personal opinion is I think that Amazon's going to continue to uh, erode away at, um, 
you know, they're going to continue to take um, business away from, you know, the outdoor industry as a whole. Uh, you know, the mom and pop sporting good dealers. Uh, I think that uh, Cabela's and Bass Pro are going to continue to grow. Uh, I'm really interested to see uh, the relaunch of Gander Outdoors. Uh, after, you know, Marcus Lomotos bought Gander Mountain. And so, you know, now it's going to be called Gander Outdoors, and they're going to relaunch here in uh, June or July. I'm really interested to see what their format's going to bring. Um, I think that Shields is doing an absolutely amazing job um, in their stores and, and creating a real retail buying experience. And so uh, I'm continually impressed by the level of customer service that they can provide. Um, Academy Sports is doing, you know, great. Dix is doing great. Uh, I think they have more stores now than any other retailer in North America. Um, you know, Walmart is continuing to sell outdoor gear and doing, you know, quite well with that. Uh, but I do see a world where basically, um, you know, it's ripe for some really big online players to come into the market and uh, be successful. I don't think anybody at this current point is really dominating the market uh, from a retail perspective. And so, you know, in that, you know, in that world as a, as a manufacturer, you know, as a consultant to a manufacturer, I would tell every single one of them, you need to be in all places that you possibly can, you know, if, if you want to be in the retail market and, um, you know, you're going to, you're going to go out there and play that game. Um, and you gotta learn how to promote yourself and, you know, become a brand worthy of it. You know, example, you know, Sitka is a company that's doing it, you know, everything the right way. Uh, they're donating money to the conservation programs across North America. They're supporting every conservation organization that's out there. Uh, they've got they've helped start the two percent for conservation program, uh, so they force their own staff members uh, to volunteer for conservation organizations, as well as they donate one percent of their total uh, revenue or profit to conservation organizations, uh, and they're donating, I'm sure, a tremendous amount more than that. Uh, they've got the Sitka Films program, which is fantastic, and it's innovating and uh, pushing outdoor artists to produce, you know, some amazing films and some amazing, uh, you know, content out there. Uh, they have the Diverge Photo Program, which is, uh, you know, probably one of the best um, photo contests in the outdoor industry. Uh, and they're, you know, doing a tremendous job of promoting themselves on social media. I think that's what companies are going to need to do to be successful. Um, it is more complicated today than it was 10 years ago before Facebook. Uh, and before social media was, you know, really a big thing. Uh, but I think the opportunities uh, for companies to, to do it well uh, is tremendous. And I think companies really need to pay attention to, you know, what's going on. And, you know, they need to hire the right consultants and the right team members to, you know, guide them through the process to make sure that they make the right decisions as they go forward. I think that we're also going to see uh, a lot of companies uh, go under over the next, you know, five to 10 years. And we're going to see a lot of companies get bought up by bigger companies. So, you know, I think overall the, the industry is changing. I never say that it's a bad thing, though. Um, it's just it's just change. I mean, that's just the reality of the world we live in. Things are going to be changing. They're not the same as they were when I was 10 years old. They're not going to be the same when I'm 60. And, you know, you got to be aware of that and, and go with the flow. That's for sure. And, and listeners, uh, Kevin just gave you, a bunch of reasons if you want to get in this industry where you should think about and he, he told you about Sitka Deer is a perfect example of that so study them not that everybody should apply for a job at Sitka Deer but everybody's going to need similar talents that did not exist five to ten years ago guaranteed the talents that yeah, no. are needed today did not exist five or ten years so what does that mean to you well if you're an outdoor person and kind of want to hang with outdoor people and, and be in that industry, then figure out your niche and, and then go apply yourself and find the need for that with XYZ company and then go to work. I don't yeah, know. I see, I see a tremendous number of people, you know, my age and above who uh, are constantly, you know, bashing the millennials uh, on a daily basis. It's, it's, you know, the kids and the youth of today, they're, they're bashing them. And then, you know, like, I don't know. Today, it's the, the, you know, the Tide Pod Challenge has got to be the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my entire life. But, uh, you know, millennials today, they have technology at their fingertips. I mean, these kids today are taking a cell phone 
And some of them are running full on entire businesses all the way through. It's just tremendous what some of these kids are able to do. And, you know, if, if I was a college student today, I'd want to be taking, you know, journalism courses, business courses, analytics courses, uh, because if, you, if you, you've got a degree in, you know, business management, but you had some, some knowledge of journalism, some knowledge of, you know, social media and the things that are going on with that, so a real understanding of analytics and statistics, uh, you could be tremendously successful in this world. Um, you know, we, I, I talked to some companies this week and I asked them about what their social media numbers were and what their statistics were, and they had no idea. And I was like, how could you not know that? <laughs> how, how, how do you not know? Like, that's where all your customers are. Um, wow. But they didn't know, you know, and, and that's, you know, those are companies that, you know, may not be here three years from now. But the companies that do understand it and that do get it, they're going to continue to dominate. I don't think anybody's dominating right now, though. I really don't. Yeah. Especially yeah. from the retail side. Yeah, you know, and I, I'm, I'm trying to think. I, I get a lot of gear, and I don't buy any gear in the store. I have yeah. it for years. That was before I, you know, had my podcast and and and, and so forth and so on. Uh, just I just didn't, you know. I used eBay quite a bit, and then I used my connections, you know, with Vortex or Excalibur or whomever, you know, uh, you know, to get to get my stuff. And plus, over the years, I've collected a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> my wife says yeah. you don't have room in your closet. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of in a unique situation because I, you know, I don't buy a lot of gear, um, but my role is to test gear on a daily basis. So gear is arriving here all the time. Um, it's li literally there are boxes laying over here that are just not even opened yet. Uh, I mean, I have an auto wild grill that's sitting here that hasn't even been installed yet. Um you know, we've got brand new pairs of boots from Loa and Crispy to test this week. Uh, I'm going to be wearing, uh, well, I'll be wearing uh, Crispy boots at Shop Show all week long on the show floor uh, or, you know, or Loa's. I'll probably rotate back and forth between the two to kind of test them against each other because uh, I walk 14 miles a day, you know, each day at Shop Show. So I just know from, you know, experience that I'm going to, you know, to burn up my feet and i want to feel think oh, that's a great place to test boots um you know i uh i still do buy some gear uh from my local retailers uh i have a cabela's and a bass pro and a shields and a dix all within 55 miles of my house uh the bass pro being the furthest i think cabela's is about 45 miles in la vista which is omaha um, I have a Shields right here in Lincoln, and they're actually building one that's like twice as big. Here, we just got a brand new Dix. Um, and um, I still buy things at Shields. I still buy, uh, I buy all my ammo from local stores, by all means. Um, I, I do, you know, FFL transfers with a local gun dealer. Um, so, you know, I'm in and out of outdoor stores on a pretty regular basis. Um, I think that the important things for stores to really focus on is making sure that the the staff that they put in those stores are highly educated and they make it, you know, an enjoyable, you know, uh, experience. I was just in an outdoor retailer uh, outside of Indianapolis uh, when we were there for ATA and, and I got there a day earlier and we went into a, a bunch of retailers and um you know, I was actually looking for, you know, a specific pair of shoes uh, to wear for ATA. And I just didn't, I didn't have, I didn't forgot to bring a pair of boots with me. And uh, I just needed a replacement pair of shoes. Uh, so we went to, um, went to Duluth Trading Company. And um, that's where I ended up buying the, the pair of shoes that I wanted was from Duluth. And, and they were great. And their customer service was literally over the top. It was the best experience in a retail store I've had in years. Um, they had a lot of staff around the place. Uh, I think there were five or six people on the floor that could help me. It's not a tremendously large store, uh, but it's very well laid out. And in each section, they had individuals that could help you. Uh, they asked, you know, I was able to ask each person questions. I think I had talked to five different staff members while I was there in the store. 
Every one of them was polite, enjoyable to be around. The store was clean. It was just a great experience. I went into another large retailer. Um, well, we went into two other large retailers there. One of them was just, you know, average. I walked in. It was fine. You know, the staff was there if I had a question, but it wasn't, you know, overly, um, it wasn't overly great or it wasn't overly bad. Uh, but we walked into another retailer and um, their customer service was miserable. And you could tell, like, I walked up to uh, a wall of hunting packs and it was jumbled and disorganized and horrible. And you could see I was agonizing over, like, looking at these different packs. I couldn't find what I was looking for, really. And uh, three different sales associates walked right by me and never, not a single one asked me if I was interested in, in getting any help. Uh, I walked over to the shoe department. And as I'm kind of going through the shoe department, um, I had to go find a sales associate to help me. And then the response that I got was, well, that shoe's on the floor. It wasn't, well, let me take you to that location and help you. And so when you have a bad buying experience like that, it makes it hard to go back into one of those, you know, back into that same store. And, you know, retailers had better learn really quickly that customer service means everything in today's world. And people may or may not buy product in the store, but your reputation is made in, when the customer is inside your store. So I don't know. I Like I said, I'm not holding this particular retail store, you know, hostage. Um, I'm not even going to mention them because it's, it's, it's not, um, it wouldn't necessarily be fair. It may have just been a bad day at that particular store. Uh, but I do know that I just, I did not have a great experience. And, you know, too many times of me not having a great experience in a, in a given store, I won't go back. And I think that's true of most consumers today. There's no question. I don't care if you're buying a car, um, having a hamburger down down the street, going to a bank. It, it doesn't matter. It, it's customer service that we expect these days. because We're paying yeah. a lot of money for what we're spending. And, you know, just give me a little help and, and make it make it a positive experience. I, I, that's the word. I like to use when I'm talking to my grandson. He's working in a restaurant, first time, first job. I said, just make it a good experience for whoever you come in contact with because everybody has a bad day, either staff or, or, or client. Just smile at them. Say, how can I help you? You know. Absolutely. You know, and and it, it just, it goes such a long way. Well, Kevin, this has been interesting. We've been around the block. We've, we've hunted some mule deer. We've talked about... Um, uh, ATA, we talked about huntinglife.com. And why don't you one more time tell people how they can find you uh, on the web? Yeah, you can find us uh, at huntinglife.com, of course. Uh, we have huntinglife.com and huntinginsider.com. Those are both of our websites. Uh, we have a live show that goes live once a week uh, at gravy.live forward slash show forward slash hunting life. Uh, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. Uh, Google Plus, uh, search at Hunting Life. And uh, we're pretty much across all platforms uh, with, you know, at Hunting Life. So uh, we have a fan page that's got about 265,000 people. And we encourage every single person to go to our Facebook fan page and submit your picture to us. And we'll share it up to the entire world uh, with your, you know, your hunting, you know, your hunting trophy photo. And, and I don't care, like I said, whether it's a big deer or it's a fork and horn or it's a doe, uh, we'll share it because um, we care about all hunters. Um, you shoot a squirrel, you got a great picture of it, send it to us. Uh, we want it up. Uh, Twitter is kind of our news feed. We really focus on uh, promoting the stories that are on our website. And, you know, we share out as many you know news articles as we possibly can that I feel that, uh, you know, hunters are going to want to pay attention to. Uh, Instagram is something we're kind of new to and we're kind of, you know, really trying to uh, again, share those stories, uh, and we're you know we're slowly learning about Instagram and what the best way to reach hunters is with that platform. Well, on behalf of thousands of listeners across North America, Kevin Paulson, HuntingLife.com. It's just been a pleasure, and I can't wait till you know we we connect again, and and we can uh, I can buy you a beer. Well, hope hopefully this fall uh, we'll be uh, get, we'll get a chance to go hunt together. Yeah, oh, I look forward to that. So, Kevin, thank you again. You got it, man. 
on the next episode, we're heading down south, and we're going to connect with Wes of Portland Outdoors. Who's Portland Outdoors? It was a group of three guys that decided they loved the outdoors so much they wanted to get into the business, and they did it big time. They've got a product called Top Secret Deer Sense. It's unique because it's oxygen-free from collection to the bottle. Scent defense, hey, use this every time you go out. And we talked, uh, we're talking about on the show about uh, putting on your boots and uh, it's some interesting uh, thoughts there. We got a natural, they have a natural uh, bug repellent. And uh, fourth, they have a fog uh, zero. So anytime you go from different temperatures, things change, uh, your glasses, uh, your uh, shooting glasses, uh, binoculars, they're all going to be fog free. Even more than that, Wes is just one heck of a fun guy. He loves hunting. He loves taking his kids out hunting and showing them the benefits of the other. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.